Hey, you want to get strong? We got the program for you. MAPS Strong. We wrote this with a friend of ours, Robert Oberst. He's a professional strongman competitor. It's strongman inspired. You develop incredible muscle, strength, and believe it or not, some agility and work capacity because strongman competitions require all of those things. This program is especially effective for getting the back and the posterior chain in general. That's the glutes uh, developed. Great program. We're giving it away for free to one of you lucky viewers. Aren't you lucky? Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to Maps Strong. Also, one day left for our December special. This is it. Last day. Ready for this? Maps Hit, 50% off. Maps Split, 50% off. They're both half off. This is the last day. Made me go through puberty. I cracked my voice. I'm so excited. Go check them out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code DEC50 for a discount, for the 50% off discount on those programs. DEC50. Don't forget it. All right? Here comes the show. The best exercise for your biceps, it's not curls. <gasps> All right, guys. I know. Wait what? a minute. I know. Everybody's like, big biceps got to do the Where curls. Where do we even go you know, from here? All right, I'm going to tell a story right now uh, of when I really pieced this together. I had a gymnast that worked for me as a trainer years ago. It was, it was a, this dude was about, I don't know, 5'10", jacked, like incredible arms. Like, you, know, you ever seen like competitive gymnasts, male gymnasts in particular, well, female gymnasts too, but male gymnasts, they just have like these like amateur bodybuilding looking arms. And I asked him once, like, what do you do for your biceps? Dude? Your arms look crazy. And he goes, chin-ups. I'm like, that's a back exercise. He goes, no, it's a, it's a bicep exercise if you do it like this. And he jumps up on the bar, gets a curl grip. And rather than pulling his chest to the bar, he does this kind of like compound lift for his biceps. And then it dawned on me. If I want my quads to really grow, it's not leg extensions, it's squats, right? Yeah. If I want to build a bigger back, I'm not, it's not you know pullovers, it's, it's rows, right? So it's like a compound lift for the biceps. In fact, we often accept that for triceps, like close grip bench press or dips. Right. But for some reason, biceps, we don't do that. Anyway, started doing them, and they're hard, so they're really advanced. And uh, made a huge. It, made, it put the curls to shame. Because they're of hard. Their, yeah, I think that's where it is, right? It's so much easier to just look in the mirror, and and, and pump pump it up. Like is that this. what you think we do? You know what? That's that's, that's, a, that's that's a really good point you bring up, and I wonder why that is. That so we everybody is pretty familiar with close grip bench press for your triceps. We talk about it all the time. I've, it's not the first time I've heard anyone talk. It's, it's popular, mm -hmm. but it, you don't hear that often about, you know, supinated pull-ups as a great bicep exercise like people, but it's, it, that's a perfect comparison. It's yeah. very similar to the, what tricep or what the incline uh, press is for triceps, but for biceps, and, yeah, and I no think one that, talks about it. I think it's – Justin hit it, right? It's hard as hell. So first off, doing a, a supinated grip chin up or pull up is hard anyway. Mm -hmm. But now rather than pulling your chest to the bar, right, you're kind of focused on the biceps. And because it's so supinated, some people have issues with their wrists. So one thing you can do – is you if you can find a bar, PRX has this, right? So we work with a company called PRX and they have oh, I love their handle grips. Yeah, multiple it. grips. And one of them is supinated, but it's almost like an easy curl bar. So it's kind of like this. Mm -hmm. That's excellent for doing what I'm about to, you know, what I'm demonstrating. But you do got to pull with the biceps, not as much with the back. So you're not doing this, you're pulling like this, and it just blows up the biceps. You know who does a lot of the, those that so exercise? So you're a little protracted with your shoulders then yes. as opposed to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just like retracted. with close grip bench press, like you're putting the, the emphasis on the triceps. With this kind of a, a pull-up, you're putting the emphasis on the biceps. You know what? There's one athlete that does a lot of those types of... Friend of ours? Chin -ups. No, no. Um, no, we don't know anybody that does. Okay. But there's one uh, category of athletes that relies on very, very strong arms and biceps. Besides that, a gymnast? Besides a gymnast. Arm wrestlers. Arm wrestlers do lots of those kinds of chin ups. In fact, if you watch, really, do you yeah. call them athletes? Yeah, bro, come on. Yeah. You ever you ever arm wrestle? Like no, I know. I hey, I'm gonna offend everybody. I'm just like I. I Not everybody. It's like a novelty thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know. If you if, if let's you, call them athletes. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if in the Olympics they have you know baton twirling, I'm pretty yeah. sure arm wrestling <laughs> yeah. is a sport. I feel like if I can call men's physique a sport, you should be able to call arm wrestling a sport. For sure, a hundred percent. For yes. sure. But but <laughs> those guys and girls, they do exercises like that, and then you'll see top arm wrestlers. They'll often demonstrate one arm pull ups, 
and you'll notice that it's like it's all bicep when they do the pull up, and it's what it their and their arms are for strength athletes. They have incredible looking arms and biceps, but yeah, I did this, and I still do this every once in a while. And there's no bicep exercise that I I can that I've done that will hit my arms the same way. No, I like I like that a lot, and in that elbow position too. There's not a lot of bicep exercises that emulate that either. That's another part, another feature about that. So, effect, yes, compound lift, heavy, hard, novel, right. all those things for sure. And then also, how many machines do you know where your elbow is positioned mm -hmm. up by your ears? Not just that. It's up by your ears. And then the, as the exercise progresses, it now moves through this this wild range of motion. Yeah, My elbow goes from behind my you know, by my head to in front of my body to my side, all within the same yeah. exercise. So. What happens essentially is if you look at the bicep that's connected in two points, we're going to simplify. There's two heads, but let's just simplify, right? There's two points, and when it contracts, it brings them together. But what bicep curl exercises bring this part of the bicep closer to this one, right? So when I do this, it's the part that's pulling my lower arm up. When you're doing a chin-up, it's doing this almost to both sides. So it's a very different feel, different pull. And I, I'm going to give everybody a warning if you do these – be careful because they will wreck your arms like nothing you've ever done before. They're yeah. really, really tough, and the pump is absolutely insane. But it's a compound lift for the biceps. So you're probably right, Justin. That's probably why they are really hard because it's hard for people to do regular pull-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, it's even harder when you, you're trying not to let the back involve. The back's the, the the biggest part of that movement, and when you take it out and you try and use, I mean, it's going to be involved. Well, but and, and plus, you have so many cable machines and different like uh, machines specifically geared for biceps because it's like a favorite muscle of people yeah. work, and so you have all these other options that are like much easier to just get into that's just something like you really have to it's a lot more demanding to get to do something like that yeah my tip would be if you've never tried this is to assist it with a band first mm -hmm. so you could really concentrate on the form and hopefully get like five to ten reps versus you know struggling just mm -hmm. to get one or two you, you know? can also make this a pumping exercise with a lat pull down bar so you can use lighter weight mm. Like you're gonna do a lat pull down, grab that supinated grip, and then do what I said, where you're focusing on the biceps on the way down. And because the weight's lighter, you can get do more reps. You'll get a crazy pump, but it's, again, it's a compound lift for the biceps. So I actually used to do mm. uh, lat pull down bar and bicep curls behind yeah. my head. So that was like an extra because again, trying to uh, trying to go after that that elbow position. There's just that's not a lot of machines, uh, and you can't with with gravity, right? Do obviously do it with free weight stuff. So you have to find creative ways to target the the bicep from that mm -hmm. elbow position and so that used to be an exercise that i love to do which is the lat pull down bar Behind seated, the head. yeah yeah sitting down and then i'm just i'm curling to the back of my neck that's a gnarly squeeze by the way it is it's a very very strange mm -hmm. uh squeeze mm -hmm. you don't feel like with any other exercise but you know again if you if you examine if we listed the top one or two exercises per body part in terms of just sheer muscle and strength building effect you know uh effectiveness and uh, I want to be clear, all exercises have value if applied appropriately. This includes isolation exercises, correctional exercises, and compound lifts. But if you were to list the top two or three, like just muscle building movements for each body part, what you'll see are, are compound lifts. Like yeah. the, na the number one shoulder builder is going to be a oh, press, right? press. Yeah. right? The number one chest builder is a horizontal press. The number one back exercise, a row or a pull down or a pull up. Yeah, they just skipped right over biceps. I think that is really interesting. Yeah, that uh, we, we've we associated even triceps, like you said, with like dips and you can do things where you're mm -hmm. doing a compound lift, but biceps just you know, it just seems like there isn't anything. For yeah. It. And I think if people did it and then started to understand how to feel it, because once you do it, it's going to feel kind of weird at first, especially if you've always done pull-ups a particular way, it's like a different kind of a uh, pulling yourself up. And again, you, the risk of injury is high because the tension's high and you might not have the technique or form. So I think what you gave was great advice, Adam, to yeah. start light with assistance or even like I said, with a lat pull down bar. But once you get into the groove of it and feel it, you'll be like, what the hell? I've, mi I've been missing out on such an effective bicep. You exercise. could also use the tips that we've given around isometrics to, to help you figure this out too, right? Mm. So I'd get a band underneath there, have somebody do an isometric hold at the bottom, thinking about squeezing and flexing the bicep, and then another one where you're all the way to the top, squeezing and focusing on there. Oh, like you're just holding yourself yeah, above the just, bar? Yeah, exactly. Just holding yourself at the top and holding yourself at the bottom will help you engage the biceps more when you try and practice a movement like 
like that that you're not used to. This is one of the other great values of isometrics is when you when you when you're trying to do an exercise that traditionally isn't for that specific muscle group, doing an isometric contraction for the muscle yeah. you do want to work in that will help you connect. They're just good for yeah, familiarizing yourself with yeah. that uh, yeah that contraction that movement and what you're trying to produce out of it. Yeah, you know it's funny. Uh, I've been going through studies on isometrics. Funny you bring this up, right? And the studies show that so. There's obviously when you work out, use resistance, the goals typically are strength and muscle building. Isometrics, the muscle building effect you get from them, now it's shorter lived, but the initial muscle gain and strength gain is actually faster than you mm -hmm. get from traditional lifting. So what, what happens when you incorporate isometrics is you get this very steep and dramatic rise in muscle and strength. Now it starts to plateau if you don't incorporate traditional exercises, which is why it's my belief that isometrics are best used to supplement traditional uh, resistance training. But man, if you read the literature on the strength gains yeah. and the muscle gains in short periods of time, you, it's nothing matches isometrics. Now, what's your, an effective way to summon the troops. What yes. are your, what's your theory on why it does have quicker results? Why that's, do you, that's why. Yeah, because why? it's it's uh, neuromuscular. It's, it's your... You're you're tapping into that central nervous system response of like, hey, like I'm I'm gonna need to activate more muscle fibers yep. because I'm put, placing more intensity uh, and demand uh, on this particular squeeze, and so you can actually ramp that up and and get more of a response, but. Now you actually have to then, from there, like you said, you have to go into those lifts where it actually places the load and everything else to account for. Yeah, so you so think you're actually recruiting more muscle fibers isometrically contracting than doing a full contraction? It's a fact. Yeah. It's a fact. So so once you're well-trained- You're squeezing way more potential. Yes. Out. So act, really tapping into and activating muscle fibers is part of the, that's part of the- the goal, right, with resistance training. And what you'll find with, with um, experienced athletes, especially experienced strength athletes, is they could they can activate more of their muscle fibers than the average person. I don't know what the number is, but it's uh, significant, right? Isometrics make that happen much faster, probably because there's a shorter learning curve. Mm -hmm. So like you take- That's somebody, what I would have said. It's yes. easier. It's easier to figure out where- there's more room for error in a in a yes. traditional full range of motion lift. Yes. There's like someone can do, for example, let's take a very basic, easy one, bicep curls. Mm -hmm. And when they're actually doing a full contraction, many times it starts off really well bicep, but then shoulders kick in and momentum yep. kicks in. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so you lose some of the value as far as keeping it all focused on the bicep versus I take a bar and I put it halfway up in an isometric contraction and I just squeeze and flex the bicep. I feel like- It's much more localized. Yeah, it's localized yes, yeah. it's, and it's easy to localize it. There's yeah. less room for error. And uh, like, I'm not going to be squeezing that and my calves light up or my- right. Well, you'd have to basically go through each one of those angles isometrically to, you know, maintain that same amount of intense tension. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it requires a lot more focus yes. to get to that point. It also, it also causes less muscle damage than both eccentric and concentric contractions. So concentric is like going up, eccentric. And going now that's down. the part that I find interesting because you you say that it, it recruits more muscle fibers, but then yet it does less damage. It does less that's damage. Really interesting. Yeah. Yes, think because about of the, what is it? The sliding filament theory, which is like okay, so muscle fibers. Okay, we're gonna get all weird here, but muscle fibers run along each other, and and the the prevailing theory as to how muscles contract is they attach to each other while they're sliding past each other and contract and hold. But as you do the contraction, some of these attachments break and that's what causes the damage or inflammation. Well, an isometric hold, they attach, they hold, and they contract. So there's less potential for damage. Eccentric, right? Lowering causes the most damage because as you lower, you're breaking a lot yeah, of these. Yeah, they're spreading apart. Yeah. yeah, and that's the theory, right? So you can do... I, so here's like the cool thing about isometrics. You can do them frequently. So... I can hammer my, you know, chest maybe a couple days a week or a few days a week. I could do isometrics every day at my level, right? So a beginner maybe less, but it's less damage, mm -hmm. which is cool because you can ramp up volume without worrying so much about overtraining. Mm -hmm. So whatever routine you're doing, you may think, hey, I want to add a little bit. Isometrics is a great way to do it. In fact, isometrics is one of those lost arts of resistance training. It was so heavily favored. At the turn of the, you know, at the turn of the 19th century, the strong men and all those guys, you know, Eugene Sandow and all those, you know, strong men and, and women that did just incredible feats of strength, isometrics was a, a staple in their training. 
that also highlights why things like Ken stretch uh, are so much better than just traditional like yes. yoga, right? So both of them are taking you in these stretched positions, but Ken stretch includes the isometric contraction in there where you're really intensifying. So you're building, you're building muscle in that new range of motion that you know you normally are being strong in those poses. Right. You're not right. just you're not just stretching into that position and relaxing and holding that holding that position. You're actually isometrically contracting in there. So you're recruiting all these extra muscle fibers and actually building some yeah. strength and in that newfound range of motion. You know who's a huge fan of isometrics? Uh, I've said this before. Uh, Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lee did probably he did resistance training. He was one of the first martial artists to do it. In fact, he at, he worked with bodybuilders at the time and yeah, asked to develop them, his physique to, and everything too. Because right? he noticed that it, yeah. it, the story goes that this is legend, but I don't know if it's true. He wrote this himself, but he says that he got into a fight. He won, but then he was so surprised at how fatigued he was and how weak his body felt at the end. So he said, I need to you know do more physical conditioning. Well, resistance training became a part of it. And obviously Bruce Lee, not a big guy, but at the time, probably one of the most muscular people on screen actually um, inspired a lot of pro bodybuilders to become bodybuilders. I know Flex Wheeler talked about Bruce Lee mm -hmm. being one of you know, does that lat spread in the beginning when he's kind of warming up to fight or whatever. And isometrics was a huge part of his routine. And it was said that he could hold a, I want to say 200 pound dumbbell at arm's length and hold it steady. And he said the isometrics gave him incredible punching power because mm -hmm. of the stability that he developed. So it really does work. Um, it's not so popular nowadays, which is, Interesting, probably because it's not sexy, but um, I, I foresee this being the next big thing in fitness. Again, of course, usually it's the old stuff that comes back, so it's not going to be the you know the next big thing. It's the next old thing that becomes the next big thing. Yeah, I've been way ahead of my time with a lot of these things. So we'll see if it catches up or way behind. However you look well, at yeah, it, yeah, way behind. <laughs> Either way you look at it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I got to tell you guys something ridiculous that happened tonight. <laughs> so. Jessica and I are, are hanging out. We're about to start watching TV, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I got this this uh, new strain of, of cannabis uh, called Wedding Cake, which is uh, actually a pretty good strain. So I'm you know hitting it a little bit, and it's stronger than what I normally mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Normally, I aim for like lower lowish THC, like 10, 12 percent. This was twenty two percent. So, how did the bud tender sell you on this? Like, I, I'm always curious because they always have like the, <laughs> these ridiculous like terms for things yeah. and like how it's going to make you feel. I, I always love that part. Yeah. I actually ordered it delivered. So oh, I had them okay, deliver. Okay. Yeah. So I went through and looked myself and, and I had read that wedding cake was a good, like to inspire creativity and all that stuff. So well, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Anyway, I had a it's little nostalgic too, blend, had a little you know, too much and romantic. I can get a little paranoid and kind of whatever, you know, when I have a little too much, I think most people get yeah. that way sober. Yeah, I know. Like, it's what I'm saying. <laughs> I could just I'm already, imagine. I already feel like the government's watching me all the time. So anyway, I, I did that. Then we turned the TV on and we're watching and I pause it because her and I are having a conversation and it's talking like 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 a voice in the background. I'm like, what the hell? What is that? So, so like, the screen's frozen, but there's still voices. Yeah. And I'm like, what? So I turn it off, turn it back on, and then we start talking. And then I hear it again. So I'm like, what the hell is going on? So then I unplug it. I'm like, oh, I got to oh, I gotta reboot this stupid TV it's or whatever. Haunted, dude. So I reboot it, and then I plug it back in. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying anything to Jessica, but in my head, I'm like, you know, there's a camera on that TV. What if I can overhear the people watching? <laughs> I'm so high. So, yeah, dude. so like, I knew they were watching us. Those mother, you know. So I'm like, but I'm quiet, right? So I'm like, wait a minute. I hear the sound again, and I'm like, let's let's hear what they're saying. And it goes, yeah. He goes nine minutes thirty six seconds. I'm like, what? Huh? What? It's like a countdown. Like, what's Tell. going on? <laughs> Tell destruction. Like, yeah, what, what's happening here? And then, you know, nine minutes, you know, 27 seconds. I'm like starting to freak out a little bit. And so I'm like, what the? And so then I, I, it, Jessica and I are looking Seven at each other. Days. I get her paranoid. So we're like, and then I wait, I go, hold on a second. And I go to the settings and I go to the settings and it goes, and I go to, I guess there's a feature on your TV where it will read. Whatever's on the TV. Oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, tell you what it's you're pushing. It's stupid Samsung things, man. That's, yes, dude. That we happened at, remember the Truckee house? Oh, we were trapped man. in that for like a month. We oh. couldn't figure it out. Yeah, so I, now this happened, and I find it, and I'm like, oh, that's what's happening. And I switch it off, and then Jessica starts giggling, and I'm like, what's so funny? She goes, the baby was playing with the remote control today. He must have done it. I'm like, oh, yeah, thanks for telling me now. 
You know, oh. After I think the FBI is watching me on the oh, camera. Oh, that's hilarious. I'm like, how the hell did that it's happen? That's so, to you. you know, it's so funny. You bring up a weed story. Uh, I had a really interesting night last night from weed. Uh, and <laughs> I know, right? So, uh, so we have like our routine where Katrina goes up and takes Max in the bath and everything like that. It's getting him ready. And I'll, I'll be downstairs. And actually, what uh, why I, I wanted to bring it up or talk about it was because, you know, sometimes... Uh, uh, at least it's it's getting better now, but you know there's a stigma around marijuana. Like there's a stigma around using it or smoking it, and it's either like you're using it for pain or you just want to. It's get a hot. lot better, but it's that's, that's still there. Right? Yeah, no, nobody it, says any of you drink a glass of wine. But. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. It's still there, and and here's where I like what I enjoy about it even more than a glass of wine because I think that's a good comparison of like kind of relaxing and settle down. Sure. And I think I talk a lot about that on the show, but there's another part that I really enjoy, and I don't know if anybody else uses it this way, but I've got tremendous value from it, is uh, when I have a little, like I have a little much, like to your point with the strong, because I, exact same thing, I got a, a new strain and it was, it's like fire right now. And, and when, anytime I get like a new strain that's really strong, I my my dosing is off a little yeah. bit. And so I had a little more than probably what I wanted, but the positive effect of that was I get really introspective when that happens. Like I find myself like really going deep on myself, like, you know, challenging my own personal beliefs and being grateful for where I'm currently at. And am I being a good partner? Is this when we get those loving texts? From no, it is. It really is. It's like, because I, I- Sometimes I, they're out of nowhere. It's like 1030 at night. And I was like, I really love you guys. I mean, it, the, yeah. so that's probably what's going on because this is not the first time this has happened to me. I don't think I've shared this on the podcast, but I really enjoy this part. Now, can you do this sober and are people who meditate? I, yeah, absolutely. So I'm not saying like you need to do this, but it is something that I have found tremendous value. I, like I sat and journaled. I journaled for like 30 minutes I, in my iPhone just writing and just it flows out of me because I get really, really deep on myself and my relationships and gratitude. And I don't know, I, I've always been a person and I don't know if it's the ADD in me or what, but have a hard time sometimes with just traditional meditating with saying like, okay, I'm going to slot yeah. this half hour, hour, and I'm just going to sit there and try and. So you get like super introspective. Oh, big time. Yeah. I mean, like that's what it, the whole thing. It was, I mean, everything from, uh, you know, am I a good partner? Am I a good leader? Am I, you know, if, am I, am I being a good father? Am I making sure that the, the people I say that I care about, like challenging my own beliefs, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, I say these things, do I act that way? Do I, you know, the people that I, I love, I say that I love and I care about, do I show them that? Now, I, do you read it the next day and does it still make sense? Or is it like when sometimes we come up with business ideas with cannabis and the next day we're like, what? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So what top the, ramen flavored protein? That's powder. more common mm. for the the business stuff. Yeah. When I when I write like this, uh, like it, maybe one of you guys would read it because it's kind of scattered. Because yeah. I'm just what I'll do is I just I just write it. I'm not trying to write something that I'm going to present to anyone. It's a journal, so it's like. I just start writing my feelings. It's cathartic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I actually get emo I got emotional. I got emotional as I'm doing it. I'm thinking about being a dad. I'm thinking yeah. about Katrina. And I'm thinking about all those things. But I mean, I find a really good value in it because then I then I look at it and I read it and not, not like the business one where you're like, oh, that was a stupid high idea, but it more so like what was going through my head. And then it, it now it has all these reminders of like, hey, listen, like, that that is important to me. And when was the last time I went and, and yeah. showed these people that I, I really love about them? Or what am I? Well, I always say that love is an action, right? So if I say that I love this person, I love that person. Okay, well then, what have I done to show that? Mm -hmm. And so just kind of challenging my and or the things too, like maybe we talked about something on the podcast and I felt really strongly about something like that. That will pop up in my head, just like you know, why do I think that? Why am I so you know adamant about that? Or why do I feel so strongly about just challenging that? I. And I feel I can do that on a on a deeper level when I'm in that state. When I'm in that state of mind, uh, everything else kind of melts away, and it, I can just go real deep. Yeah, you know what? The, so not to get too nerdy, but the, they've done studies on that creativity and cannabis. Mm -hmm. And they, there's a classic way to test this. And I think, for lack of a better term, I can't quite remember what they refer to it as, but it's something like word association. So I'll say to you, think of all the words that, you know, you can think of that connect to the word dog, right? And then you give me a list of words and they find that when people are under the influence of cannabis, that they're able to come up with a wider range of words and, and phrases that connect to a particular thing. I can't remember mm. what it's called, but there's a term for it. And they do say that it improves that ability. And there's a couple theories as to why. One of them has to do with simply changing. So it's like, you're always stuck on the same channel, right? So you're on, you know, 
channel number two, right? Mm-hmm. It's for people who remember what TVs were like back in the day. It bridges like other parts of the brain. Well, right? yes, that's what's happening in a, uh, I guess, a, a, on the physiological level or what happens to the brain. But, but in terms of psychologically, what they think is you're stuck on this channel. You change it a little bit. That's all you did. You just change the channel a little bit. Yeah. And then now it's like you see things from a different angle. So people will I think I think I'm going to stop you right there hard. because I think that's such a beautiful way yeah. to say it and the 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 feeling that I experienced. I'll tell you what what triggered it. So I'm high, I'm cleaning, and I actually had this like you know, um feeling uh what's that what's the word where I don't feel appreciated for how I keep this house. Oh. Right? Total <laughs> yeah. total like yeah. I totally can relate to like the the housewife that takes care of the place and mm-hmm. like you know, Katrina comes down and it's clean and it's nice, but like man, I'm like Little, I mean, on the on the with the Clorox wipe on the the floors here, straightening the blank. Like, I'm like super anal about all this stuff. And if it I looked, ever have to live with a roommate, it's you, dude. It's so, sure. but my my point is though, what triggered it was I actually had kind of a, a negative attitude, mm. and I and I was I caught myself. I kind of stopped and I thought like, what a, what a shitty way to to look at this. Like instead, and it switched to that. It switched channels. Yeah. And, I, and like instead of me like kind of like begrudgingly doing the dishes. I switched over to like, man, how amazing is this? My yeah. wife's up there taking care of the kid. I'm I'm down here. Like, what what a beautiful place that we have. Like, it's so relaxing. I've, and like, and it completely just switched me to another channel. Same situation. I had kind of a negative attitude about it, like initially, and I caught myself having that that kind of negative attitude, and it completely switched me to another channel. And now I went down the rabbit hole of gratitude, and then all of a sudden it was like grateful and like happy and. So real wild, but that's a great way to say yeah, it. Yeah, and they, they, it'll happen to people when they go on vacation. So they're mm-hmm. in a different mm-hmm. environment or when they move or when they see things from... Okay, so here's a good example of what I'm talking about. You've ever done this? Have you ever done this where you sleep over your friend's house and you wake up and in, for a split second... Don't know where you're at. You yeah. don't know where you're at and everything looks very different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or there's those those games where they'll show like a picture of a common object, but from a weird angle or up close, and you have to guess what it is, right? So it's like you're seeing things from a slightly different angle, and then when you can do that, you your all your your beliefs and understandings of that now have the opportunity to change, and so that's what they think is happening happening psychologically, and it can happen with a lot of substances. Like most mind altering substances, will do that just a little differently. Um, and cannabis has been known to do that. Now, they do say that people come up with more ideas, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming up with good ideas. Right. However, yeah, right. creative people appreciate more, right? We appreciate more ideas because yeah. we can shoot down all the bad ones and pick the best. So I'd rather have a lot of ideas that I need to sift through than none and sit there right. and not you know, know what the hell is. Now, stuck. how do you explain yeah. if you have like a super, super powerful strain and you see ghosts? Yeah, what? What happened to you? Yeah. Did that happen to you? Yeah, I told you guys this story a long time ago when I was like playing music. Oh. It was very similar to, to kind of a funny thing with you know, right. your TV where the amp was you know providing feedback and I was like playing and we were singing this stupid song. And it, like there was a little voice, a little kid's voice that was singing along with us. <laughs> no shit, dude. Yeah, dude. For real. Yeah. Hey. So here's I opened up a channel, dude. I, no, I'm glad you said that because <laughs> when I, people will l- hear this and they'll be like, "Oh, cool! Like I'm just gonna smoke weed and it's gonna be great and all that stuff." It's a double edged sword. <laughs> just, <it's> so <laughs> yeah, it can make it can it can also do the opposite. My brain was doing a little too much. Uh, creativity Dude, in there i the first time i ever really felt it because remember you know remember you know remember the myth when you were a kid where people were like oh the first time you smoke weed you won't feel it right remember that you guys yeah, hear that yeah. this is a stupid myth from the 90s not yeah. true but everybody said that so i was in the car with uh at the time my girlfriend and her friend and her friend's boyfriend he was driving and he was older and he's like a big pot smoker and he's passing the the, the pipe around and I'm like, well, this is my first time. Like, I'm going to make sure I feel it. So I went hard and the paranoia and fear hit yeah. me like nothing. And I became introspective in a negative way. Yeah, so did I. So it wasn't like what you did where it became positive. Yeah. It spiraled into this negative craziness and I s- never touched it again for up until I was in my late 20s pretty that much. That happened to me. That yeah. was my all Similar. through my 20s I didn't smoke any weed. I was that's why it was so ironic. I mean obviously the the, the podcast people uh you know I'm I'm known as kind of the weed guy cuz I tell my old weed stories at the cannabis club and then I'm open about it now. 
But the truth was in my circle of friends and where I grew up, like I was the anti-weed guy yeah. because I, the one time I tried it, I had the exact same situation where yeah. someone told me that, oh yeah, like, you know, a lot of times you won't even feel it the first time. So I had the attitude like, well, I'm going to feel this. And yeah. so I sat there. You're a go-getter, bro. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, saying? yeah. How you doing? You do everything, right? Same so thing. I sat, I sat down and I was with a, a circle of buddies that have been smoking their whole life and like I kept going even when they were done and. I paid for it. I think a lot of that is that it's uh, that whatever it, whatever it is that's going on with the brain is you're uncomfortable with that because you've never been there before mm. and it gets very scary and you get paranoid. You don't and, know how to navigate. Yeah, you don't know how to navigate it. And I also didn't realize like, you know, if, if I'm if I'm using it as a tool to tap into certain things that, you know, there's, there's a, uh, there's a spectrum of like where I want to be. Like I, I don't, I could have just, I didn't realize until later on, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with just having one or two puffs to just get that slight mind altering yep. place where you're not stoned or super high, like, and, and like curled up in a ball, like you could have just a little bit of it and have, get the benefits that you're looking for and not go overboard. And, and that's kind of how I, I still this day, that's how I use it. It's interesting. Sometimes I go a little, like get something strong like you did. And then it, it sends me into a deeper mm -hmm. rabbit hole that I, I haven't gone in in a while. And I think that's one of the things I really enjoy well, about well, it is when I, when I can get like, well, that. this is why the research on, um, some of these substances and therapy is so it's blowing people's minds. Although the original research that was done before these drugs got so demonized, um, showed a lot of similar stuff. And that is that you, you have people who are stuck in this like post-traumatic stress situation or this fear loop or whatever, they can't get out of it. And then they will take a little bit of psilocybin or MDMA or LSD Work with the therapist because there's a professional there supporting you. Feel very safe because you're in a, a good setting. So you're not like, a, that's by the way, a large percentage of the paranoia that people feel for marijuana is yes, marijuana can cause that, but also the fear that comes along with doing something illegal. I know this because when I was a kid, it was highly illegal. Yeah. So you're already hiding. Yeah. You're already worried. Now you're in that state of mind, and then you do it, and it's a totally. It's more likely to 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 contribute to that, right? So you always thought helicopters were following you, dude. Like, you, every time you have no idea. <laughs> like, I, I thought, like yeah, nobody cares. I thought the CIA was after yeah. me, which is like, why? Why would they be after me? <laughs> but anyway, because that was another story. But anyway, so with these psychedelics, they do them, and what it does is it allows the person to go into things and talk about things that they normally. You're you're so uncomfortable talking about that you actually block well, you, yourself. You face it, you know. Yes. And you stand in front of it, and I think it's it's a powerful tool in that sense that you yeah. can actually revisit some trauma. You can actually you know work your way through it. It's really hard to get to that point where you can even dive deep enough. You to know how there. many people have trauma that they can't even acknowledge. Yeah, it's they don't like even it's been buried, so they can't. They don't even know how to get there. It's a it's and it's a fascinating yeah. protection mechanism from the brain where yeah. they literally. Don't acknowledge it. Didn't happen. It's not there. Although the body remembers it, the body has reactions. They right. feel anxious. They don't know why. What's going on? And then when they finally are able to face it, they can they can process it. You know, and that's that's some of the theories as to why this these therapies are so effective. Well, speaking of powerful tools, you know, shout out to Justin for oh. remembering pure Yay. this time commercial I took boy the pure ahead of time so i remembered <laughs> is that that's how that works is that why i have one and you yeah. don't already had yours i already had mine no 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 let me see that because i always do the packets i haven't done that so this is just same thing as the packets right you just take a scoop yeah watch out you can overdo it but, yeah uh, so no. this stuff is um it's legit it is not now i haven't taken now i mean and you would probably be the person to, to test this any benefits to taking a larger dose than what is? I know, I've experimented with it, and will bit. it make you feel your stomach upset? Or not, yeah, not much re repercussion. Yeah, I'm not going to recommend people take what's not uh, recommended, uh, but I have taken more, and I've been okay. Oh and yeah, do, yeah, and I do. I like to combine. The, well, you guys know me. I like to combine everything. So I like to combine pure with a nice dose of stimulant, so like caffeine. Yeah, and it's Same. a really, really, really good. Uh, yeah. feeling and it does feel like you're you're sharper but this is one of those supplements you could take all the time and it does you don't feel like you get that um yeah. what's the word uh tolerance yeah if i have a day like you had yesterday oh where you're God. like it's odd like seven podcasts or something oh you had to do yesterday i would do a, a a nitro coffee i would do pure and i'd also do theanine and that's like my brain exploding stack is this one of those things that um the as you consistently use it the effects yes. 
get better versus something that you just use like instead of the opposite where sometimes like so what what is that what 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 causes that with some supplements some supplements yeah. there is a like uh, acute feeling yeah there's acute feeling and it actually diminishes the more consistent you are long -term. then there's other supplements that the more consistent you you take for example creatine the more consistent you take yes. you take it i think the more benefits versus this one time i take it i feel this acute thing so a good example is caffeine so caffeine's very acute it works very quickly. Your body starts to adapt by down regulating receptors and reducing its own production of other catecholamines. And so you feel it right away. The first time you take caffeine, or if you haven't taken it in a while, is the best, right? And then you start to lose its effect and you need more. But there's other things like this. Like, so Pure has lion's mane in there, for example. So lion's mane, over time, increases BDNF in the brain. That's brain-derived neurotropic factor. It it helps the brain, uh, I guess, nourish Always the brain. Always sounds like an ACDC song. To it me. does, huh? Right. BDN. It. Yeah. It, it basically what it's doing is it's it's encouraging uh, a healthier, for lack of a better term, a healthier, better functioning brain. So like exercise, when I work out the first time, eh, I kind of feel it. But as I continue doing it, I see more and more improvements. And so some some supplements are like that. So Pure is one of those. It's not a I take it once. Wow. It's like you take it over time and you start to feel. It you know. seems like it's that way with a lot of like a mushroom stuff, yes. right? Like adaptogens are like yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's literally adaptogens, 100%. That's what it they is. They tend to work that way. Okay. Yeah. Some, are, some have a little bit more acute than others, but yeah, over time, they start to feel- So how was effect. your, I saw your story, you were doing the Mind Pump story the other day, what your supplement stack, I oh, saw geez. you must have combined like 10 things. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to I, I mean, did it pan out? I mean, how, how, how was it? Back in the laboratory again? What are you doing, dude? So it's, I don't recommend, this is, the, you know, this is the whole like, I'm a better trainer for other people than myself. So I like to throw things together that I read about, see what happens, and then, you know, whatever. And so I took uh, Agmatine, um, ashwagandha, which I always like with stimulants. I did a pre-workout, uh, so that includes caffeine. Um, taurine, let me think, what else did I put in there? Theanine. Yohimbi, I thought I saw. And Yohimbi, yeah, because the, th the pre-workout was just caffeine, so I threw a little bit, of, like three milligrams of Yohimbi. So if I'm talking really fast right now, it's probably... <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of hyperactivity, so have you guys heard of the connection between food dyes and hyperactivity in children? Oh no, I haven't. Okay, and there's a lot of that. The in, only like, thing I heard was like, food. yeah, like the red dyes, like how uh, toxic they were. Okay, so parents have been talking about this for, for a while. while, and there's lots of anecdote. Now the FDA is like, no, there's no connection. I was going to say, is this all correlation stuff, or have we got some good hard? No. Events? So in Europe, they banned a lot of food dyes because they found connections. Really? Oh, our wow. our FDA is like, eh. But anyway, we go back. So there's a bill in California right now that's they're gonna they they may try to pass. That's going to ban some of these food dyes for children. And it's based off of a, an analysis of, uh, I, I don't remember how many studies. It was like uh, 70 or 80 studies. And 64% of them found a connection between hyperactivity and food dyes. And then the other, you know, 30, whatever, 36% found no connection. So, how are they measuring that? What do you, what is it like all like survey where the, you like, is your kid hyperactive and da da da? And then, I, I think they actually put them in. Um, these are, I think, many of them are controlled. Really? Yeah, and because it's easy, right? You can have a kid sit there, give them, you know, Cheetos or whatever, and then observe how they how they act and how they move and what's going on. There was a story in the article I read of these parents who their kid was just like, you know, oh, he's the worst case of ADHD we've ever seen, and they were putting their kids on antipsychotic medications and whatever for like a year, and then they had a family friend who said, hey, I read that. Uh, red dye, there's a blue dye, I think, that does this. And they said hmm. that, you know, people are saying there's a connection. They eliminated him from their kid's diet. And within four weeks, they're like, my child came back. They said he was totally normal. What's the, Crazy. The gross offenders there, like you mentioned, uh, Cheetos or like processed food, like juices, like what else are they? Shit, almost all kids like processed foods. Yeah, like I'm this. wondering, like, what are the biggest. Uh, Let me read the especially food all the one, all the ones that have like food coloring, the, probably the gogurts and the right. crazy colors. You know what I'm saying? If you're eating a all food and it's hyper blue stuff. or yeah. purple, you know, there's, a, yeah. there's yeah. a good chance you're using food dyes. Yeah, it says so, and and this is from uh, this report. So the evidence supports a relationship between food dye exposure and adverse behavioral outcomes in children, both with and without pre-existing pre-existing excuse me behavioral disorders. 
Let me see what the food dyes are. I know one of them was red. Uh, let me see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try looking these up. Yeah, so there was a study in 2007 in the United Kingdom that found a link. and They, they started banning some of the stuff. It's Okay, so red number 40, yellow number five, and blue uh, number one were the ones that are most, that parents are noticing the most effects, especially the red, hmm. the red ones. So if you have a kid like this, maybe look and see at what they're eating and say, you know, and maybe take them out. Wow. Yeah. You got to think too, yeah. that when uh, it's, they have to be even more sensitive because how young they are. Wouldn't you think? I think so. Like, I feel like something like that would have, would affect us less than a child that's being, that's de in development stages of their life. Well, I also think that an adult is more aware of how something, not that we're all great, super aware, but I feel like if I ate something and then all of a sudden felt like, you know, whatever, I'd be able to identify and verbalize it. Right? You have a three-year-old or a four-year-old. Yeah, they don't know. No, they don't know. They're just bouncing off the wall. And then because they're kids, you're like, oh, that's just how kids act. Yeah. So, you know. So they got that working against them and sugar, you know, and the combo of both, I'm sure. Yeah. And most I feel of like products. sugar is worse in my oh, opinion. Dude. And you know what? Some People are like if you. I would assume if you already have ADD tendencies, it's probably like I definitely. I got diagnosed as an adult oh, yeah. with ADD. I would imagine that I would probably that people like me would be more sensitive potentially uh, to stuff like this. So I don't. know. It's funny. I did a, a post yesterday. I did like a answer, like ask questions and I'll answer them. Yeah. And someone said, "How come you didn't go to you know college and all that stuff?" And I said, "Honestly, sitting in a class is torture." Mm -hmm. that environment so hard for me. And I said, you know, I have ADD. Anyway, someone responded. This was a uh, very educated young lady. And she goes, I'm surprised that you you read all the research papers you do with ADD. And I said, oh, that's a common misconception. I said, ADD doesn't mean you can't focus. It means right. it's hard to focus. And then when you're into something, you hyper-focus. Mm -hmm. You can hyper-focus on certain things. So I said, it's I've been able to use it as a strength and, you know, build my work around it. Yeah. You're basically. passionate about those things. Yes. Yeah, you're, you know, you're not reading stuff that you, you, we were being told to read. You you're guys reading. know how annoying I am with that, right? It's very so annoying hard. when it comes to that. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> the audience that's curious, I can, if I send I'm Sal, I'm surprised every time. If I send Sal a <laughs> article that will take two minutes to <laughs> read, door, didn't I? he will not read it. You yeah. know, it has to be his idea and a thing that he's interested in or else he's not fucking reading it. But if we, he's we've interested tried leaving in it, it on his seat, you oh, know, like uh, I've tried tons of things. I car. just go straight to Jessica. That's what I do now. Oh, I just like if I need him to to read it and I really need him to read it and I know he won't, I'll just say, hey, Jessica, check this out. Read it. And then I know <laughs> she'll read it and then she'll, hey, Adam sent this really cool book or this really cool thing over and then he'll get no, it. No, she won't say you because if she does, I'm like, forget it. <laughs> All <laughs> she, right. Yeah, she'll just say she's no, found this. Kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just I'm totally uh, joking. Oh, it's so true. So anyway, uh, man, it's been cold here in NorCal. It was like, it hit like, uh, the 20s the other yeah, day. Yeah, somebody flipped a switch because, yeah, it's it's starting to really get uh, frosty and everything in the morning. Like, Is it colder where you guys yeah, are? Yeah, it's cold. It's I mean, you see your breath and everything. I mean, we sound like such pussies. Like, <laughs> I know. There's so many people out. I mean, you like in freezing. As I used to live in Chicago, so like I know what that feels like. Yeah. But, yeah, being... You know, acclimated again here in, into California, like this is it definitely shifted dramatically. Now, let me ask you because you're a polar bear essentially. Yeah. Now you always have your chili pad set to the coldest temperature. I do. Windows open. Do you do that now when it's cold too, or do you I, warm it up? Or I just keep it the same temperature. So it's it's. I mean, I'm not trying to warm up because the the house is being heated as it is and, and Courtney ends up turning her side up a bit, you know, to kind of compensate. But if, if I, and it, it is kind of a little more uh, challenging because it's cold getting into it. It's more cold when it's cold outside and you get into that, like, Ugh, it's uncomfortable, but uh, I prefer it that way because then when I'm actually in my deep sleep, I have mm -hmm. such better quality sleep. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Adam? You're I'm the same. I'm the same way. And that's exactly right, what he just said. Because I actually, I shower every night before I go to bed too. So I'm coming fresh out of the shower. I have the door open in there. It is very cold there right now. So the room is like, free. Katrina's like, you're fucking crazy. It's so cold in here. <laughs> uh, and then what, so she's sleeping I, in full pajamas and everything? Oh, yeah. She's uh, full, full pajama. Like, I always tease her all the time. I'm like, God, you're so crazy how you wear it, how you can sleep in like full attire and not be uncomfortable. Um, but she's like, it's so goddamn cold. I need to have all these clothes on. I'm like, all right, I get it. Touche. So 
Uh, when I climb in, though, so what I'll do is because she keeps hers at like 92 or 95, something like that. What? Yeah, she loves wow. it. She likes it. Cooking. Hot, dude. Like crazy hot. Oh, and I, I tried to, like, she, like. Courtney's like 70s. Man. She thought I'm the weird one. I'm like, no, I'm like, look at our son. Like, so when he climbs into our bed, if he, he sleeps on hers, he likes to cuddle next to her. He's He's got the sheets all kicked off and he's all opened up because her side is so goddamn warm. I'm like, it's not that. She's like a hot pocket. Yeah, she likes it. She, but uh, so in the more, so what I'll do when I climb in is I climb over to her side because it is like if it's cold in the room <laughs> and then the sheets are 50, I think 52 or 55, whatever the lowest I keep it at. I mean, it is. The sheets are ice cold. And yeah. so I'll climb over to her side. Yeah. It'll heat me up really fast where I'm almost uncomfortably and hot. Back. And then I, yeah. and I kind of like what I do is I, I inch my body over. So I start all at her side. I get hot real quick, probably cuddling with her in 15 minutes. And then I like one, one arm, one leg over there and then half, Slowly move half over. my back. And then eventually I'm all the way over there. And then it's like perfect. And I sleep like, and it makes, I tell you what. Because it's been, the equalizer, dude, because it's rare that two people are identical with, with the temperature they prefer. It's probably the biggest, I guess I'm generalizing, but one of the biggest, like, uh, you know, quarrels between, mm -hmm. you know, couples is the thermostat. Thermostat wars. The, the bed. I mean, it's so, like, you know. It's so stereotypical, too. Yeah, but know? I think it's true. It is, but I don't, do you know somebody who doesn't? Like I don't know a cu I personally I don't, I don't know anybody. Like, I personally exactly I do not have a, I know plenty of like flip flop that where the the girl is hot the guy's cold yeah. like but I've never met a couple actually where well waiting. I got I just got one from my parents and and it's it's funny to listen to them because uh, it, of course you know decades together like and then all of a sudden them having the ability to have different temperatures like they, they can't stop talking to me about it and i'm like i told you well and, and plus the fact they just got a new bed they used to have this like water bed that was just like a water bed whoa, like, like who God. has water beds the anymore 70s. yeah i was like you, you never buy a water bed still yeah dude so they totally like upgraded their entire sleep situation and uh, so yeah, so the the chili pad was a big part of that too. Wow, they have a water bed. A water bed, dude. You like, I remember that too as a kid. It, My brother and I would get on it and be like, Whoa. you know, you move, you know, some apartments and how they'll tell you specifically if you move in here, you can't have a water bed. Really? Yeah, because oh, they yeah, leak to the yeah, risk. Leak. Yeah, of well, flooding, right? Uh -huh. Maybe neighbors sense. underneath you or like that. Uh -huh. I, you know, I was, um, you know. I remember when, and I think we've talked about this before. I remember when I was a kid and I slept on like a hand-me-down bed forever. And I just thought I was like a restless sleeper. And that's just how I sleep because my whole life up to that point, that's what it was. And then was, I this, got a, was it one of those old ones where like the middle is deeper? Oh, yeah. It's like a taco. Yeah. I used to call it a taco <laughs> bed. I think I was the third third generation of who had that bed. Like beds just was the last like 10 years. It's still on the outside like, and then you just... Yeah, it, it, then, totally. Yeah. Right. So uh, so I was just a terrible sleeper. It never once did it dawn on me as a, as a kid that oh, it's, I have a shitty bed. Bed. You don't think like that. That's hilarious. Yeah. And when I bought my house when I was 22, uh, that was like the first like the major purchase. Mm -hmm. I need a bed, right? And so I went out and got like a top of the line, like handcrafted Chatham and Wells bed. And I, I had the mo the the first night I slept on it. It was the best night of sleep I had in my entire life. And it was like, yeah. oh my God, I can improve this. Like I just thought I'd sleep like this. The chili bed had a very similar uh experience for me. Yeah. When I for when we first got those. And I, cause I, I have, this is always a, a kind of a wrestle or fight. Dude, I have cousins now when they travel, they bring it with them. That's I would, how much they like it. That, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it makes that big when you, again, it was that type of a, a like moment for me of, whoa, this makes a big difference to be able to keep, to find what your ideal temperature is for like the most optimal sleep. Man, and what's cool now is we have tools so you can kind of track this stuff. So you could track your your sleep and how much you move and if you get up and everything like that and, and really yeah. kind of measure and drill in on, okay, my body loves this temperature right here. I get the deepest sleep. And then to wake up, I'm going to bring it up. And yeah. boy, that's been a, it's been a game changer for me. Oh, before I forget, I, I read this interesting story uh, yesterday, which I thought was hilarious. Well, first off, the reason why I was reading it is because there's a bit of a crime wave that's going through a lot of areas, including Northern California here oh. in the Bay Area. Has uh, nothing to do with, uh, you know, allowing uh, people to steal it, 90, shit. How, how Under $950. Under $950. It? It has nothing to do with that. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's like smashing grabs. Whatever. Anyway, there was a shooting at Oak Ridge Mall. Oh, my uh, God. You know, That's couple, right. Yeah. A couple nights ago. Like, I can't remember the last time there was a shooting in that part of that. I mean, that's kind of like where I grew up, right? It's really crazy. It's crazy to see all this crime. So yeah. I'm reading this stuff about this, you know, crime increases. I have a brother-in-law that's a police officer and he's like, oh yeah, it's uh, especially now Christmas seasons when break-ins happen because they know there's gifts that they could break in and steal and all that right. stuff. 
And so then I found this article because I'm searching and reading. There was this car thief. This is the craziest story ever, okay? Kind of a good story, kind of not. I don't know how to judge it, but he steals this woman's car and 30 minutes later drives back and and literally lectures her because she left the baby in the car. So she went inside. That's an old story. She went inside the store. That's a hell of an old story. Is it? Yeah. I'm going to pull it up. So pull I'm it up pull because that's something, I think you brought it up like two years ago. Did I really? Yeah. Okay, so I just read this. I just read this. Yeah, that, maybe I brought it up a year or two ago. Do you remember that story? I remember when we first uh, landed on the moon. So <laughs> I was going to bring that up next, but. Um, <laughs> Bro, you're yeah, not do remember that story. You're a dick. <laughs> listen, listen. Joe, you got, that's, that's an old story. Maybe it was me who brought it up and maybe that's why you don't remember. I, you don't yeah. listen to anything I say, so no. that's probably what fucking what happened. <laughs> no, so, but I mean. I just I totally remember that story because I thought it was hilarious yeah, because the guy she stole went the car to the store. and the baby was in the car Super and ironic. he came back. That's an old story. But it's at hey, least a could couple you years imagine old. if you're the mom oh, in that and you're like, I would no, actually of course be, not. I would, yeah, thief returns car with baby. Yeah, I would be, it was uh, I'll January I'll of this year. Wow, what yeah, an idiot. Uh, in uh, Beaverton, right. Oregon. <laughs> so it's a, Sal, all right. A year old? Point okay, for Sal. Wait, hold on a second. It'll What's be, the score so far? Be one, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hold on. Wait a second. You're going to count that as a win ship for you? I believe Adam there. You're going to count that as a win for you? It's no, a no. story from last year. It's literally- Well, this year, but early. 12 months ago. Uh, <laughs> did you bring it up 12 months uh, ago? I had to have. I, I remember that story, yeah. and I and I, I remember- But talking. how crazy is that? Like, yeah. First off, what are you doing leaving your kid in this car while you go inside the store yeah yeah but she could you imagine you go outside oh my god then the thief comes back it's like i kind of want to hug you but i also want to kill you like, so how did it end did he end up giving the car back or did he like drop no, he the took kid off. off and then take yeah he, he lectured her and then took off <laughs> Dude, he's yes. like why the fuck you leave a kid what? in the car when you i'm like man thank god that criminal some criminals have at least i guess there's a humans there's like are a, so complicated weird i swear did you weird. see the one that tim kennedy shared where the the, the lady had the awareness to uh, kind of like shoo everybody out of the store and then she went outside the store and then she locked him in the store. Locked two in the store. So Tim Kennedy posted this. Go on Tim Kennedy's okay. uh, IG, uh, like probably, I want to say two weeks ago or so. And there's this dude and he comes in and I, I don't know what kind of store it was, but she, he, he comes in the store to rob the store. He's got a oh. gun and he comes walking in and she kind of had the awareness. You see her, it's all on camera. So you see her in the background and she's kind of like telling everybody to get out. And then he like goes over the counter, give me all your stuff. And then everybody clears the store and lets him be in there by himself. And then she goes and locks, him, locks him in. Hell yeah. And, then, and it's got Beautiful. bars and everything. And he starts like crying. Oh, let me oh, out, please. Because oh, oh, he knows he's going to get caught. Yeah. And, and he's breaking, he's trying to break the door to get guess. out. And he's Fuck stuck. Yeah. And then eventually no. the cops show up and they no, get the him. The best one I saw ever. This is the best one. You can find the video and we'll put it on the YouTube channel. This dude goes into a weed shop or a head shop where they sell bongs and pipes and shit. And he comes in and he's like, give me all your money. There's like three of them. One of the workers picks up like a, a two-foot bong and fucking oh, starts swinging the it. bong. I saw that. Dude. Yeah. And they run he's away. wielding a bong, like just like shooting him out. <laughs> yeah. the and they're like, ah. And like, they run away and shit because he's going to kick their ass <laughs> oh, with the bong. God. I'm like, dude, that's embarrassing if you're a criminal. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You got beat yeah, up by a bong. You got beat up by a bong. Hey, real quick. Look, if you lead a balanced, healthy life, that means you probably enjoy the occasional glass of wine or drink. Uh, with your friends and family members or your spouse, right? Alcohol has some values. The problem is if you're into fitness and health, it can make you feel like crap. That's why we partnered with Z-Biotics. They made the first and only patented genetically modified probiotic drink designed to counter the negative effects of alcohol. And it really, really works. We've tested it many times. It's a revolutionary product with revolutionary technology. Again, it's patented. So there's nothing out there like it. You got to try it, and you try it once. I promise you'll be back. The stuff is crazy. So if you're interested, head over to zbiotics.com. That's Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S.com forward slash mind pump, and then use this code for 10% off. Mind pump 10. That's mind pump one zero for 10% off. All right, enjoy the rest of the show. First question is from Neam's Fit. How can I get more definition in my arms? I feel like my arms are just pure mass with no tricep or bicep definition. Yeah, you, you got to just get leaner. You know, there's two parts to this. because Arm blobs. Yes, if you get leaner, no matter what, you're going to have definition. But if you have muscle underneath that body fat, then you don't have to get as lean to see uh, as much definition. So it is two-part. The whole myth of spot reduction is just that. It's a myth. So you can't choose to burn body fat from an area and then just train that area. I don't care. I know people are like, oh, there's one study that showed maybe. Okay. 
If there is an effect, it's so negligible, it's not true. Also, there's other studies that show that doesn't work, so don't waste your time with that. But you can get leaner overall. That's what gives you definition. And then if you develop the muscle underneath, you don't have to get as lean to look like you have definition because there's muscle there and it gives you shape. There's not much really to add to that. I, I mean, know. that's that is the answer to this. And I, I think the thing that keeps uh, or kept me when I was younger from doing that was I had the the skinny guy complex, and so the thought of leaning out or losing weight or getting smaller just terrified me. Yeah. Uh, and so I would probably ask questions just like this. Like, you know, I, I do, I want to, I, obviously I want to get bigger everywhere, but specifically, can I get my arms more defined or more cut looking? And be like, get leaner, like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, know, what? Lean out, lose muscle, go on a diet? Like, that sounds so scary to me. But, you know, if you haven't really done that, like, get shredded. I mean, this is why I think there's like tremendous value in taking yourself to a body fat percentage that you've never been to before because you learn so many things. But, and this is one of these things yeah. that you'll learn. You'll go through mm -hmm. it and you'll be like, Oh shit, this is the look I know what do. you're working with. Yeah. You know, and, and to peel down to, you know, body fat percentage where it does reveal like what kind of actual muscle mass you have, where you need to maybe place your focuses on, like maybe it's your shoulders. You need to develop more. Maybe it's, you know, the triceps need more emphasis, but you know, to be able to even see those lines, I think is the first step. Yeah. I do want, I do want to add this that I, and, and I don't know if there's, this is just um, a correlation between the timing when this happened in my life or not, but you know, we've talked before on the show about um, how like lifting heavy gives you that kind of granite look. Yeah. Like dense muscle. I noticed that because um, I, I didn't, I was very like the first, like, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 years you know, tricep, maybe, maybe the heaviest loaded kind of tricep exercise I did was like a skull crusher. Everything else was cable push downs, rope things mm -hmm. and like machines like crazy. I really didn't do a lot of dips. I didn't do any in close, close grip bench press. Um, when I introduced those into my training, my arms blew up. And then I also noticed that they, they just maintain a size. Like yeah. I, even when I haven't lifted my arms in weeks, I still have those, the tricep lines. When I see from the side of my body, I didn't have that in the first like 10 years of lifting. And I was training very hard and consistently. And so I attribute that to those types of lifts that put on more mass to my arms. Totally. I, I had to say, I had a yeah. really crazy experience with my midsection. So I, um, you know, like you, Adam, I was ectomorphish, right? So I, I just kind of always lean and I would try to bulk to gain. And at one point I said, okay, I want to try and see if I can get like a nice six pack, right? I was going to go to uh, Italy for the summer. And so I got my body fat down to 10%, which is for most people will have a six pack. Now in the mirror, if I really flexed, I could kind of see it. But if I was relaxed, I couldn't see it. So I'm like, oh, I want a six pack while I'm relaxed. I had to get my body fat all the way down to, I think it was like 7% for that to happen, which is really hard and really low uh, for most people, definitely for me. Now, later on, I started to realize that the abs in the core muscles were just like any other muscle. And the way I trained them before was like the, you know, what you, what you, what you read in the bodybuilding magazines, right? Which is like, oh, core, abs, high reps, right? Lots of reps, no rest periods. That'll make them look better, more sculpted. I'm like, well, they're a muscle. If I want to build them, I should train them like I would if I wanted to build my shoulders or my legs or any other muscle group. So I started training them with higher tension, more resistance, lower repetition. So now I'm doing eight to 12 reps, higher tension. So like decline sit-ups and Roman chair sit-ups and, you know, flag, what are they called? Dragon flag exercises. And I started to build the muscles of my core. Now, as they built, I started to have a six pack that was visible without flexing at 10% yeah. body fat. Yeah. You know, because the muscles were bigger and more visible. So building muscle also increases that, that I guess, that the look of def definition. Less muscle means you got to get way leaner, in my opinion, to look like, like, if, like my arms are going to look leaner at a higher body fat percentage than somebody who doesn't have much muscle on their arms at a lower body fat percentage, just more muscle there. So there's two parts to that, right? Build the muscle but you also got to get leaner. So my, my generic specific advice I would give this person is that, okay, get leaner than you've ever been in your life. So it reveals where you're currently at. Then when you go back into a bulk, make sure you're doing things like dips, close grip bench, uh, supinated pull-ups for your arms. Yep. Do these exercises that are going to build mass on your arms and train them that way. Train mm -hmm. like if you've never done it, and maybe you're somebody who trains higher reps and, the, and chasing the pump like I was do some good strength building exercises for the arms on your bulk on the way up. And, and hopefully that makes a difference.
Next question is from Emily Powell 79. I'm stuck at a 225 pound conventional deadlift and want to get to 240. What do I need to do to progress? All right. So this is, it's hard to answer questions like this because it depends on who I'm yeah, talking to. Sort of the back history too. Yeah. Like I don't know what your workout routine looks like or your technique or where the weak links are. So this is going to be kind of general advice. With some exercises, there are other exercises that have such a huge carryover that sometimes when you're stuck at one exercise, you've plateaued. What you should do is focus on these other exercises that contribute, and then you'll see this carryover. So a good example would be uh, overhead press to a bench press. Oftentimes, people get stuck on the bench press, and they do all these different things. They plateau, and then I, you know, I would tell them, all right, let's get you stronger in your overhead press. They start practicing and getting better at the overhead press. Boom, their bench press goes up. Squatting really makes the deadlift go up for a lot of people. It does mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. If my squat goes up, my deadlift almost always goes up. It's not always true the other way around. If my deadlift goes up, my squat doesn't necessarily go up. I feel like a hip thrust would contribute a hip, lot to that too. Hip thrust is the yeah. other one. I was just going to say that. So yeah. squats and hip thrust. So if you've been deadlifting for a long time and you've gotten good at it, and you know Emily sounds like a, a, a female name, 225 is pretty damn good deadlift for a woman. So it's pretty good. Sounds like you've been working at it for a while. Maybe just kind of maintain your deadlift. And then try to place your focus on squatting and hip thrusting and then see if you end up getting that carryover. Yeah, I've also found value in like using a trap bar deadlift uh, as opposed to that for a nice contrast to shift my efforts on that because it's a bit different uh, recruiting yeah. uh, pattern for that. And, and also, but yeah, I mean, it, kind of transitioning to another uh, exercise that has just as much value that might strengthen certain parts of the lift you might be weak in. So something that helped me um, before, I mean, it, uh, up until I was 30 years old, I had never done this. So obviously the novelty played in a role. So if you do this already, maybe this isn't a good advice. Um, but if you've never done this, this helped me a lot, um, which was I never trained singles, doubles or triples until you guys yeah, yeah. ever in my life. Never in my life did I go pick a I wasn't a big a max out guy. I used to like joke about that all the yeah. time. You know that I used to say it doesn't matter how much I can lift, you know, if I look this way, like that's all I care about. So I never I never did anything under five reps. And even when I did five reps, it was rare. It was just to interrupt my mm -hmm. other training and then go back to like kind of hypertrophy training. So, um, and I found in, in a lot of females I've trained, not a lot of females tend to lift really heavy. A lot of girls are good about not giving a shit about their PR in the gym and not chasing that. And they, a lot of them don't do, this was Katrina, doesn't do singles, doubles, or triples. So one of the ways I got her deadlift up and my deadlift up was training that, just training in that lower rep yeah, range. Yeah, five sets of two reps. Because there is, there is a big difference, for at least for me, lifting the weight five times versus when I'm going to, when I'm learning, because there's a lot with a deadlift on how you get yourself positioned, how well you're primed, and how you can generate all that force for mm -hmm. one or two or three reps versus lifting it five or eight or ten times. Like oh, it's yeah. a it's a it's a different strategy and strength that you need for those rep ranges. So if you're somebody who's lo really looking to, uh, I've never PR'd over 225 and I want to see 240, but you've also never trained you know, like in your routine a day where you are doing singles. And when you do that, by the way, you're not trying to max out every time no, you do it no, no. but you're what you're really working on is that that explosiveness for one rep and getting better at that and you will improve you'll get better at if you've never trained that, that capacity for more force production that's right what that provides which is great another thing that if i'm getting stuck especially a sticking point for me if i'm it's from you know the bottom of the lift where you know it's the pull i like to do deficit deadlifts and kind of focus on that for a bit just to really emphasize and, and put uh you know more resistance there uh for me to overcome so i can again but this is really just addressing summoning more force and so it sort of focuses that uh attention in that part of the lift uh which if you kind of segment out parts of the lift where you feel like the the weak link is for you if you can identify that you know that might be a good strategy yeah you could also try resistance bands on the bar like let's say your workout normally is i don't know 200 pounds maybe go down to 150 get some pretty sturdy resistance bands attach them to the end of the bar and anchor them with something and now you've got this variable resistance where it gets heavier at the top that often will get someone out of a plateau you'll see a five or ten pound gain just from doing that but I think ultimately what we're all saying is a change in your programming mm -hmm. somehow. Change of focus or reps or the way that the resistance is being applied. 
change it. And, and this may mean that for two months you do something completely different and go back to it. But if you do what you've been doing, obviously, uh, it's probably not going to go anywhere. Next question is from Randy Fit. When in a caloric defi- deficit, how quickly do you lose muscle? Does it depend on how big the deficit is? Yeah, well, the, the size of the deficit will make a big difference. How quickly we lose muscle, way too many factors wow. to consider to even come up and, with a, and, a number. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the, and the main one is your genetics. Yep. There's some people, I remember when I had an ex-girlfriend that was a competitor, and I remember that uh, the coach that was training her, they, they had a real hard time with getting her to lean out to where her abs, and they had to drop her to totally unhealthy places. Like She was like 900 calories, and she was like a 140-pound, 150-pound chick, so way, way low and unhealthy, and I would never advise this. Uh, and she and she would just hang on to all of her muscle, yeah. like it would it would take that extreme just to get her to shred like a couple pounds of body fat, and she would like lose no muscle. I am literally like if I hit less than two thousand calories, it's like I may you might see on the scale, boom, I'll drop four or five pounds real quick. But then yeah. if I go test my body fat, half of it was muscle, half of it was fat. It's like just so genetically people's bodies are going to respond different to this too. So there's there's so many other variables. And then the biggest one is that, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, it is. And then the other one is, uh, are you sending a muscle building signal to your body uh, that is effective and appropriate, right? So good resistance training, a good routine for you, will send a very strong signal to the body that says, we need muscle. In that context, cutting calories typically means that your body will burn body fat and at least hold on to the muscle that you have and in some rare cases, you might even build muscle while you're in a calorie deficit. So that's something you can do with your routine, right? So I like to, when people when people are trying to get lean, what they tend to do is they go into calorie deficit, and then what they do is they throw on top of that these Cardio. super high calorie burning workouts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a great strategy. I, I think, think that's I think one of the best the opposite strat- is the best strategy. Yeah, I think one of the best strategies you can do is go into a, a very muscle building focused type routine. And cut your calories because you want that muscle building signal as loud as possible. I, I love that advice. I used to say, lift and train as if you're trying to build diet like you're trying to cut. Yes. So like you're training, which means long rest periods, heavy lifts, lift as if you were trying to put on muscle mass, mm-hmm. but then actually diet like you're trying to lean out. And so that, and I think the biggest mistake people make is what you're saying is they they go to lean out. And they do everything. Yeah. And you, when you're already in a calorie deficit like that, the the body's already kind of freaking out that oh, we're not getting all the food that we were yeah, used should to. Should we pare muscle down? Let's see. Right, right. And then all of a sudden you go run on the treadmill. In addition to that, then it's like oh, this is where we're going. We're now becoming someone who needs to do cardio, and so paring down muscle is advantageous. So it does yep, that. Yep. So. I, I, yeah, I think that's the biggest mistake is when people go to a leaning out, they they do all the things that, that have been taught like to lean yeah. out, now, ex- burn a bunch of extra calories. Now, that being said, that also could mean that you just change the stimulus. So that doesn't necessarily mean that supersets aren't a great way to get lean. If the supersets are a great muscle building signal for you because it's a new novel stimulus, that might also be okay. But, I, the, but the same, uh, the thing that we said earlier applies whatever's going to get you to build the most muscle, do that in your training and then combine that with a calorie deficit. And that'll ma- that'll help you maintain as much muscle as possible. That's another great piece of advice. And I actually give this advice regardless if it's a bulk or a cut. Anytime I'm transitioning in my diet to like, okay, I'm going to decide I'm going to start bulking right now or, oh, I'm going to decide I'm going to start cutting. Yeah. I also change the, the, the weight training stimulus. So whatever my program, so like you're yeah. saying, if – Maybe I was on the middle of a five by five type of room, so a very strength building exercise. If I was on that and then I switched to a cut, well, then maybe I'll, I'll go to supersets and hypertrophy training yeah. because it's novel. And so sending that novel signal while also manipulating your calories should be hopefully enough to lean you out while also trying to hang on to as yeah. much muscle yeah, as possible. With, with resistance training, your goal is always to build muscle. I don't care what you're doing with your diet. It's always to build muscle. Why? Because when you're losing body fat, you want to hold on to your muscle. Of course, if you're trying to gain weight, you want to build muscle. Now, some people lift weights to burn body fat. That's wrong. Does that mean lifting weights or doing resistance training doesn't burn body fat? No, that's not true. It's one of the most effective ways to burn body fat. But the goal should be to build the side effect of which is a faster metabolism and more muscle, which burn more calories, which makes you get leaner. So the goal always, now this doesn't mean you'll build. So I don't want people to freak out and be like, I'm on a calorie deficit. I'm losing strength. What's well, going to happen? But your goal should always be to build regardless of what you're doing with your diet because at the very least, you'll hold on to more muscle by doing it that way. 
Next question is from Huntley Michael. Does taking too many supplements or vitamins have possible negative consequences in regards to liver and kidney health? Yeah, it depends what you mean by too much. Like I, I, if I took a whole bottle <laughs> of, mm. you know, uh, vitamin D, I mean, will that affect well, my there's, organs? Well, okay, we, we talked about this a long time ago, and I actually think that there's this part is more common, uh, especially from health and fitness people, that take a shake, take a bar, take a multivitamin, and now you've got things like your iron and magnesium and some of these things that you don't need, that, and all of them are giving your RDA. Mm -hmm. So like you've, a lot of times you'll flip around the back of yeah. a, a, a supplement. Yeah, vitamin-fortified like, supplements, and then you take right. multivitamin. Yeah, you have a protein shake that is basically saying, here's all the vitamins you need for the day, and then you, in addition to that, you also take a multivitamin. Yeah. In addition to that, you're also taking a bar, and all of them are saying, this is everything you need for your day. And there's certain things you don't want a bunch of. There's certain things that are, are going to, are going to matter or going to be negligible, mm -hmm. but then there are certain things that we don't want too high of levels. And that I think that have an adverse effect. Yeah. It depends on what you're talking about and what you mean by too much. Like you can get away with a lot of vitamin C. If it's fat soluble vitamin, you can't really get away with too much. Creatine is very safe, but at some point, I mean, anything taken too much, can, you can drink too much water, that'll kill you. Well, you can drink, what is it, too many, take too many BCAs throughout the day and it'll actually affect your, your mental state, right? It yeah, makes depression. You depressed, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's some, some cause and effect there, but there are some, uh, you know, that would actually provide a more toxic kind of environment if you yeah. inundated you know, your body with it. Yeah. Well, what are those? So uh, it's like what I said, right? Magnesium, zinc, uh, iron. Minerals what? and fat soluble minerals, vitamins. Yeah. So that's basically- the Those are all the ones your body stores. So it doesn't get rid of what it doesn't need. It stores them. And if you keep right. taking them in- You'll store more and more and more until it you get piles. Yeah, yeah, until you get to problematic, and then it just and basically you're overwhelming the kidney kidneys because it's having to filtrate. All I don't know that. if Is it's that... going to be so much of the kidneys. It depends on the nutrient, but you'll you'll get like calcium. You can start developing calcium deposits in your arteries. Mm. Uh, too much vitamin D, I think, can cause issues if if I'm not mistaken with your skin. So it depends on the on the or it can cause deficiencies. So like too much zinc can cause a deficiency in copper, which can have its own uh, issues. So it really does depend. Um, when it comes to herbs and other weird supplements, I mean, if it's a stimulant, can you take too much? Yeah, too mm. much stimulant's gonna not be so good for well, you. Was it a problems. factor that like uh, because like pharmaceuticals are so like concentrated that that's more of an impact if you you know overdose versus supplements? Well, it's easier not being as concentrated. Yeah, like it's really hard to overdose on nutrients in nature. How, um, is it even possible? I've never heard of it. I mean, I guess you could eat like you could eat a lot of like beef liver. And you might you'll get too much iron, oh, okay. you, get, you know, because it's so dense and liver. I mean, for me, it's I mean, unheard of, iron. though, right? I've never. I mean, maybe it's possible if someone actually actively tried to do that. If someone ate four yeah, pounds of yeah. liver in a day, no. <laughs> which I don't know anybody's. You got to really. But try I don't hard, know anybody. Think, That's why I think we always recommend to go the whole whole food wise, right? Yeah, like go yeah. natural. Like if you. Yeah, I, I mean, I. This is something we we still have yet to create. I've always wondered, and I know you could Google it and find it, so we don't need to create it. But you know, I, I I've found tables where it's like. Um, the the all the like all the different foods and what vitamins and minerals they provide that your body needs <clears throat> and if you if you look at that table and you go like oh i do a pretty good job of eating all those things in rotation and you just become aware of like oh wow you know yeah. what it's been a week or two since i've had any real fruit or mm -hmm. any of these things that to me that's where you supplement that's when yeah. you utilize those things yeah, we're going into winter i want to keep uh, my vitamin d level right up, versus know. just you know every day i take this 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 and this regardless of what you don't your know what your levels are yeah and regardless if you know what your diet is i mean maybe you got plenty of that in your in your diet so why are you supplementing for that i yeah. mean it's a, a waste of money and then it could potentially yeah. have some now if you effects. look at the the reports um of liver and kidney issues um very few of them uh are related to supplements the vast majority are related to pharmaceutical uh substances and drugs mm -hmm. over the counter like tylenol tylenol oh yeah can cause some serious it's issues uh with liver um and there's lots of these pharmaceutical drugs that people use and that that's and, and they have to get processed through the liver or the kidneys um and they can cause lots of issues i, I know back in the early 2000s when i was you know, and, and lots of people were taking these over-the-counter kind of designer steroids, not, and we thought they were pro-hormones or whatever, that the they had to get processed through the liver. I mean, could you overload your liver with that? Well, yeah, you, you totally could. So um, it depends on what you're talking about and what your levels are. I do suggest when it comes to minerals and fat-soluble vitamin, vitamins to know what your levels are so you know if you're supplementing is okay or if you're taking in 
too much. Everything else, I would always stay within reason, what, what's recommended and what's found in studies. I, I, I mean, this goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. You can take too much of anything. Yeah, so. more isn't always better. Yeah, it reminds me that that there was like a contest or something where these, I don't know if it was a, a hazing at some college, but no, I was on a talk show radio. You're talking about the water competition. Yeah, who could pound the most water in a short period of time? Yeah, and the person died. Person died. Their cells literally drowned. So this is true for any substance. Uh, and it, it re, you know what I think this comes from? It sounds like a kid who's taking like three or four supplements, and their mom is like, "You're gonna hurt your liver." That was my mom. Right? You're gonna hurt your liver and your kidneys. You yeah. know? So. Um, you know, probably not, but, uh, if you are overdosing on things that get stored in your body, they can definitely cause issues. So again, uh, get those levels tested. So you know what to supplement with. Look, if you like our content, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. They can help you with most of your fitness and health goals. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal and Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam. 